How's your congregation? Everybody's good? Oh, good. Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dumber, together with my co-host, Mark Roman, Joe Statewide News Service, and jbiztechvalley.com. Well, thank you, Rabbi. It's good to be here again. And guess what? We have the consummate, the top Jew <laughs> in the legislature, <laughs> consummate Jew, the head of the state, the, the National Association of, state Le of Jewish Legislators of New York. National right. Association of Jewish Legislators of New York. Yes. Okay. Top Jew in that sense. That's right. <laughs> and then you're also uh, an assembly, assembly member, uh, Chuck Levine. And you are from like what I call, what, the Gold Coast of Long Island? It's referred to as the Gold Coast. Right. It's the North Shore of uh, Long Island, the right. northeastern portion Glen of Cove. Nassau County. Yeah. Yes, my hometown I mean, is the little city of Glen Cove. And you, so, you know, that's a lot of mansions. You have Sagamore Hill in your district. Well, Sagamore Hill is actually in Mill Neck, and that's about six miles away from where I live. That was Theodore Roosevelt's home. Right, but it's and in the district. It's, it's in my district, yeah, okay. and it is going to reopen. They've done major renovations. It should reopen any day. And if you've Wouldn't never for been... For visitors? Yeah, visitors? if you have oh, never man. been, it is just a Mark, jewel. Mark, we ought to go there. I've been there. Oh, you've been and, there? And, and I yes. will go again if I, if the opportunity arises. I mean, this is... It really is everything you're saying it is. I mean, no, it's just oddly. amazing. Because he loved animal. He loved to hunt animals, and all those heads that he, of the animals he shot are post uh, on the walls. So let me tell you a story. Yeah, Two sure. little stories. First, uh, the first time I came to New York, because I am uh, like Rabbi Simon, a Midwesterner. Uh, my father took us to New York in about 1954 or 1955. We had a motor trip from. I then lived in Wisconsin. Not Chicago, but Wisconsin. And we came to New York City, and where did he decide to take us? We didn't do anything in New York City, but he took us to Sagamore Hill, which had just opened as a national historic site. So ironically enough, all these years later, I end up representing that neighborhood in the New York State Assembly. And the great joy of being a politician yeah. is such that there's no more fun than being able to deliver a speech from the porch of uh, Sagamore Hill, uh, mm -hmm. right in the shadow of Theodore Roosevelt. But I have a very interesting story uh, that uh, involves Theodore Roosevelt and uh, the Jews. Really? So in my little hometown of Glen Cove, there was for almost 100 years a local department store known as Singer's Department Store, right. uh, founded um, in the very early 1900s by Barney Singer, who was a refugee from uh, Eastern Europe and he would peddle his wares. Actually, he would carry pots and pans on his back and go from little town to little town on the North Shore of Long Island. He once went to uh, Sagamore Hill and he knocked on the door and who should answer but Theodore Roosevelt. But Singer... Trying to selling him a pot? You know? Yes. <laughs> but Singer... Chicken in every pot. <laughs> Singer, who grew, grew up in the era of the pogrom and in the era of such fear of public yeah. officials, uh, was frightened and ran away. Uh, Roosevelt chases him, uh, and Singer, with all the pots and pans on his back, <laughs> kneels down uh, almost in obedience to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt says, in this country, no man stands beneath another. Stand up. So that's a story told uh, to this day in the Singer family. It's a great story. Oh, wow. That, yes. that yeah, is, uh, but considering you're a staunch Democrat, <laughs> <laughs> and Roosevelt was a staunch Republican, Teddy Roosevelt Well, was. Mark, that's a that's... very interesting point. But uh, I think you know, uh, and for sure the rabbi knows, because the rabbis know everything. Uh, were he alive today, he would be a Democrat. Much the same is true of uh, Abraham Lincoln. So the two great Republicans would today be Democrats. And well, some people argue that even Ronald Reagan, another great Democrat, uh, Republican, Republican yeah, but former certainly Democrat. not on those levels, he was a, he Democrat. Was a Democrat, yeah. might not be so at home in today's Republican Party. And that's a sad statement. Yeah, because he did like to bring people together. Reagan did like to, yes, know, he, did. he was less partisan. And he, he said the Democratic Party left him. He didn't. We should the write a whole Party. book because Pragmatic. there's a brand new book, Abraham Lincoln and the Jews. So you can yeah. write Theodore Roosevelt with the Jews. That's so true. start writing a book That's over there. That's true. And, and of course, yeah. Lincoln is the most fascinating of all our political characters well, the, of all time. The, uh, the Jews and Lincoln were just, I mean, you know some of the stories about 
the Jews in Lincoln? I mean, is uh, this new book is a fascinating yeah, chapter in American know, history, and we've it is covered some of that on the show here, but also going to the uh, Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. Yes, they have a lot of those stories, but there was a famous one that's local for Albany. Is that there was a rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise who was uh, started the fourth Reform congregation in the United States. He was a rabbi here in Albany. And he broke away from the Orthodox synagogue and started a Reform synagogue in the 18, eight, late 1800s. Or it probably was the late 1800s, because I think he's related to another famous rabbi named Wise, yeah. who okay. was a leader in the Reform right. movement, yes. And then he, we, he uh, was in Ohio, I believe, and yes. then he got yeah. word Cincinnati. that Elizabeth S. Grant was kicking out the Jews from his little section in... He, he would not, he would the, not allow Jewish merchants. Right, mm -hmm. because he felt they were driving up the cost of cotton. So Wise and his other people went to Abraham Lincoln and sat with him in the White House and told him what Grant was doing, and he telegraphed a message that said, you better stop this now. And he did, and the Jews were welcome back to, I think it was Kentucky and Tennessee and... And Ohio. Now, um, the um, interesting uh, part, or one of the interesting parts of this interaction is how many close friends and supporters Lincoln had who were Jews. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we shouldn't continue this conversation for too long without right. mentioning that there were Jews who served on both sides right. during mm -hmm. the Civil War, and Jews who fought and Jews who died. Mm -hmm. Um, and getting to present day, where we talk about the uh, goings on at the Capitol. Um, Hope there's a civil war there this, too. Over this, here. You uh, never know sometimes. There's an internal yeah. civil war. <laughs> no. Baruch Hashem, as uh, we say. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, because you chair the Ethics and Guidance Committee, and you're also on the Ethics the Panel. Co-chair co of the New York State Legislative Ethics Commission. Right. And you're and also chair, chair of the of Assembly the Ethics, Ethics Committee. and Guidance Committee, right. So that, I mean, I know that you can't reveal too much because it's a really secretive society that when you meet, but, when, but what can you tell us about what goes on in the Ethics Committee or in your role as co-chair in just general terms? I mean, you know, what, what, people might not understand a whole lot about it. So, so essentially we have three separate entities that interact and this is in terms of the assembly. The Senate is set up a little bit differently. So we have the actual committee on ethics in the assembly and our job is to handle any cases involving claims of sexual harassment, retaliation for sexual harassment, or discrimination. Now in addition to that there's a separate entity which is not part of the legislature that's called the Joint Commission on Public Ethics or JCOPE. JCOPE is in essence a prosecutorial mm -hmm. uh, entity and they investigate any and every violation right. so of state laws. That's, that's separate. more executive. Um, yes, that's part of the executive right. branch with appointees from the governor and the assembly and, and the, the senate. senate right. Now the third uh, entity is the uh, State Legislative Ethics Commission. So when JCOPE determines that someone has violated the laws, JCOPE uh, as a prosecutorial entity cannot impose so to speak a sentence, an assessment, or a penalty. The case is then sent, the investigation is then sent to the Legislative Ethics Commission and it's the Legislative Ethics Commission that determines first if it concurs with the findings of, the, of Jacob, and secondly, what the penalty ass or assessment should be. Now, in addition to that, Jacob's in charge of um, uh, edu uh, educating uh, members of the legislature on, um, uh, to make sure that they don't violate the laws, right. and also in charge of um, uh, reviewing our uh, financial disclosure forms, which are fairly elaborate. But the assembly also educates uh, their members on ethics and the potential violations and sexual harassment and all that. It does, and it does so. And the staff, too. It does, yeah, and the staff, yeah. and it does so in conjunction with the Legislative Ethics Commission. Okay. So it's a very interesting and so, elaborate structure. So just your responsibility with the Assembly, what can, what can you tell us that goes on, and do, do, have you ever had anyone come up to you personally and say, here's a note, but I'm being harassed or something to that effect. I mean, I'm... Well, without going into yeah. any of the facts, those things, those things do occur. 
Uh, and what we have been done, and what I'm very proud that we were able to do when we did this last year, is we established a new system, uh, very similar to what uh, my friend Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is trying to accomplish with the United States military. In the military, if someone's the victim of sexual harassment, they are very hesitant to report up the chain of command because it's going to be very, very bad potentially for their, uh, for their careers. We had had the same thing in the New York State Assembly. So last year, what we did was, um, and I was very proud to have been the chair of um, a task force that established the new policy. We have a new policy, and we have an independent investigator. So if anyone believes that they are the victim or the subject of any harassment, they can report this not, they don't have to report it to me or the speaker or anybody else, although they can, uh, but they can report this to our independent investigator who is a world-renowned professor of law at CUNY Law School in New York City and was one of the leading champions for human rights uh, in New York State and throughout the world. His name being? His name is Merrick T. Rick Rosane. Merrick, like Merrick, Long Island? Uh, precisely. Oh, okay. And T. Rome, what was it? Rosane. R-O-S-S-E-I-N. Okay. And so we have a good we have a, a good system okay. to deal with. Because that's with. the first time I've heard that name, so I yes. maybe I'm just out of the loop because this isn't my field. Well, of, <laughs> this, this is a fairly arcane area, and but I um, never heard of this gentleman. No, you so. and nor nor would you would have. You? So okay. don't don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> it would be a good no. news report. We should no. over here. Don't give him that. No, the, he's, he's a very good guy. He won't be offended. Okay. <laughs> so um, we are very very lucky to have this structure okay. that makes it easier for people who are the victims to report um, with without having the fear of retribution. I want to ask you this, and it's because it was a tough year last year. Uh, in the assembly, but I wanted to ask you about this as an, sort of as an example, but not getting into the details but that I don't think you can still, even though the key Oh, you're a good over. reporter. I'm sure but you'll I'm take just, me where you want me to go. But I'm just asking about Micah Kellner. He was an assemblyman. He was stripped of all his staff. He was accused of hitting on men and women. And he was, you know, I mean, that's what we've heard. We don't, I don't know for a fact, because I haven't heard from someone, so I heard third hand. But, you know, he was, uh, and then he decided, again, eventually, not, I guess, not to run, or I don't think Precisely. He was, okay, he wasn't defeated, he was, he just thought He decided that it was, he decided, I would imagine, that discretion is the better part of value, valor. Because valor, they took away. Which may be Talmudic in, a, in <laughs> origin originally, because I'm they, not sure. Because they took away his staff eventually, they took away, and if he. Well, his well, staff was well, only, his staff was only taken away after um, a second incident. Right. Yes. You know, he didn't learn his lesson, it was habitual, whatever. So I just wanted to ask you, when you have a fellow Jew and someone, a fellow assemblyman, tell us your feelings. You have feelings. I know you do. <laughs> so tell us your feelings about what goes through your heart and your mind when you have to deal with something like this. Mark, a very interesting question. I'm not going to comment specifically on, on Kellner's case, uh, although I can report to you that Kellner's second appeal was just denied. So he is done with his appeals process, and he, um, he got uh, uh, due process and then some uh, in terms of uh, the assembly protecting his rights. Uh, the assembly must as well protect the rights of its employees. Right. Now, um, so you ask uh, how as a fellow Jew or a fellow member of the assembly, uh, myself and other members of the uh, how do you committee feel? are, well, this is, how, this is how I feel. I was very fortunate as a youngster to have had uh, in the little city of Marinette, Wisconsin, really in the middle of nowhere, right. uh, a wonderful rabbi. And his name is uh, Leib Posner. And his brother Zalman recently passed away. Oh, really? uh, these are very, very highly respected and loved rabbis. I just wanted to interject, it was the biggest rabbis in the Chabad movement. Precisely. And my rabbi, Yehuda Leib Posner, uh, was one of the first students, yeshiva students, of uh, the Rebbe, Rebbe in, uh, in Brooklyn in 1940 or 41. So now how does it happen that it, of all the places for a, a phenomenal rabbi to be assigned, he ends up in Marinette, Wisconsin, a city of 11,000 people, with uh, at that point maybe two dozen Jewish families. Well, there had been a family in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan um, that had a son, and they wanted this son bar mitzvahed. They communicated with the Rebbe. The Rebbe knew that Rabbi Posner was in California, 
and was coming back on the train from California to New York. So the Rebbe, Rebbe assigned uh, Rabbi Posner to go to Iron Mountain, Michigan. Mm -hmm. You have not been, you may have been there because you're from Chicago, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure there. you've been there. Mark, I doubt yeah. you've ever been there. I've been there many times. Uh, and he prepared, Rabbi Posner prepared this youngster for his bar mitzvah. At the same time, um, my little town, which is maybe 140 miles away from Iron Mountain, needed a rabbi. And someone from my town had been at the bar mitzvah oh. and asked Rabbi Posner, will he come to my little town? Right. Rabbi Posner communicated with the Rebbe, and the Rebbe said, by all means. So Rabbi Posner gave us, <laughs> gave us a commitment for, I think it was yeah. two or three years, uh, and um, he was my teacher. Okay. Uh, he not only taught me a little bit, the little I know, uh, about um, Hebrew or Jewish culture, because I did not grow up in a, an environment of Jewish culture, uh, but he also taught us how to play baseball, and he was just a wonderful man. And he is still alive. He lives in Brooklyn, and he and I are, are still in touch. Oh. So I think the point Did is... Did you call him the for point advice? Is, I have spoken with him about serious things. About the ethics of the legislature? Um, or? Not specifically okay. about the ethics of the legislature, but about ethics in general, okay. and about doing what he taught us, which is to do what's right. Mm -hmm. So my job is to do what's right. And whether it's someone who is Jewish right. that is involved, unfortunately, uh, or whether it's someone who is any other faith, it's the same. It's the same process. Uh, right, I understand. And but this deals with the integrity of the government of the state of New York. I am also a parent, yeah. and I have a son who's been involved in government and politics, and my daughter, uh, for a while, was involved in politics as well. And the idea that anyone in a position of power would use that position unfairly to manipulate young people is abhorrent to me, and I think I can thank my rabbi uh, for teaching me that. And the idea is... Pull your mic up a little. Yeah, that's good. So the idea yeah. is that um, whether someone is okay. of any faith or another, doesn't much matter. But They've I, got, they ha our obligation okay. as members of the government is to nurture and protect but, and mentor young people who work the, there. This is the cold analysis that you're giving me. Yes. I'm asking you for your heart, for your pathos, what, is, go, what goes through your heart when do you shake your head and go, oi, this is not, th th this is That this has happened, beyond. Mark, many times. You know? Yes. I mean, I just can't imagine what, you know, how hard your, your hair must have been black when you first took over the uh, <laughs> Ethics Commission. <laughs> I just can't imagine no, no, what goes not, through. Not quite, not <laughs> quite. So, look, we have to do what's right. And whether it's a member of the assembly who is taking advantage of young people, or it's a member of the, right, the but, clergy, or any asking, other yeah. person, we have, to, we have to do what's right. We have to protect the people. And that's the, that's the consideration that is of paramount importance. It's to do what's right. It, we can't, we I, have to be dispassionate. In order to be fair, we right. have to be dispassionate. But you do have a heart. And you do have feelings. Well, everyone you know, does. Some people would debate whether I have a heart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. But I really wanted to get to that uh, point. But, you know, I think it's, a, you know, I think the fact that you do have that, you know, you, you're very much into the law and you look at, you know, you're on the codes committee, the judiciary committee. You know, you very much, you know, well, I pra practiced law for many, many years. Right. <laughs> Ethics, you know, I mean, yes. all of that goes into the practice of law. Were you a prosecutor at some point? Or? Not exactly. I was a criminal defense lawyer, but mm -hmm. over the years I have um, um, gotten more convictions than most prosecutors would ever yeah. hope to, uh, uh -huh. hope to, uh, to have. So, I did that for a long time and handled difficult cases. Oh, by the way, yeah. just go back a little step about right. my, my Rabbi Posner. Yeah. So Rabbi Posner wore a black hat. He had a beard uh, and wore black clothing in a little town which was where you know, there were, mm -hmm. the Jews were few and far between. Right. We were the vestigial remnants of what had once been a large Jewish population at the turn of the um, previous century, right. that's the 1800s going into the 1900s. Uh, and to, and he, he, he was very, it was very obvious, and obvious to anyone in the community that 
this was someone very, very different. Um, and that was a cause of some consternation for some members of the Jewish community. But in my house, we just thought that was great. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, very good. So uh, what's going on in the Judiciary Committee that's hot? That's a hot topic. Well, this year, what's going to occur is that because of the cloud that's hanging over the Senate, we uh, very much doubt that there's going to be much movement uh, towards the resolution of any of the major issues involving the judiciary or any of the other committees because the Senate is going to unfortunately um, be recoiling uh, from the cloud that's hang hanging over it. So, And everyone on the Senate side that I spoke to said that's not, that they're pushing aside because Scalos wasn't uh, uh, indicted. I mean, it was just the, he's a, some investigation. Some of the senators were subpoenaed, but they don't know, they don't have anything more than that, so they want to get on with the issues. I, I and, know. And hope the end of June comes quick, more quickly. <laughs> but uh, a good uh, Talmudic analysis would tell us that, uh, well, what else are they going to say? <laughs> okay. So, so let, me, let me ask you quickly about the education investment tax credit, because that's one of the big issues that might come up before the end of the year. How do you feel about that? How do you stand on that? What's your position Let me on ask that? Mark, we had people before us, we have so many assemblymen and senators, they were trying to push it in the budget. Well, obviously the budget passed and it's not there. So it can be just the, it the can be, format, yes. it can be um, it passed can, without the budget. It can be a freestanding bill. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, is, it is a freestanding bill, so we will wait and we will see what happens. Uh, well, I am fairly agnostic why? Uh, on this uh, because at a time when we don't have enough money for education, to be able to have an investment tax credit which could net some people, did, um, forget deductions, it's not a deduction, it's a tax credit, credit mm -hmm. of many, many thousands of dollars it might be a little bit, it might be a little too elaborate, and I've discussed this with some of the uh, the people who, who are pushing it. So we're, I just yeah. don't, I don't know, and I would also like, but as I said, you know, I could vote for it, I could vote against it. Right. I would like to see a few more protections like for pub, for public education. Like what? what well, to make sure that uh, at least uh, a certain guaranteed percentage of whatever is uh, not going to the state of New York goes to public education. Look, uh, I understand the theory and I appreciate the, the theory that those who send their children to parochial schools, whether they're Jewish schools or Catholic schools, uh, ought to be entitled to some assistance. And the state does assist to a certain extent. Over, the, over time, however, the state has um, not fully honored its obligation. Uh, to pay the parochial schools for mandated services. I'm pleased to say the last couple of years that we've done a whole lot better in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, of doing that. So I understand the, uh, the concern and I understand the friction. The philosophy of, of those who back the bill, however, is that this will be as good for public education right. as it will be for private education. And I um, don't tend to think that's necessarily correct because the folks who've got the, mo the money to make these contributions with are not going to be contributing towards the schools in New York State that most need the financial assistance. And if I could figure out a way, and hint, hint, nod, nod, wink, wink, uh, to make sure that there was some guarantee, I would look at this uh, perhaps a little less agnostically. Okay. I know more we're not supposed to be agnostic. More favor. <laughs> I know. More favor. I didn't say. I didn't say I look at this atheistically. That's right. No. Okay. No. But your power of on it. As we say, I'm power. I'm far. Of. <laughs> okay. All right. So maybe they could find ways to tweet, you know, the bill to make it more accessible to the schools that need them. It's a very okay. interesting concept, and I think there's much to be said for it, but it still, in my opinion, needs some work, and we well, have to. We yeah. have to make sure that those schools in New York State which are most in distress get some assistance. Have you been and they are on, not have you been going to, on this? of course, oh. so that, but we know, and we know intellectually, to be intellectually honest, no one's going to be making contributions to those schools that most need the financial help, the financial assistance. And if we could figure out some way to do that, then I'd be a whole lot more comfortable. Okay. And I've expressed that, I've expressed that for a long a time. Point. So let me ask you, uh, a about the um, 
the bill about the, the, the Senate side, the Senate passed the EITC in January. I think they did that the first day they were here. Yeah. Yes. So are you, uh, but they said now they're reworking it. Do you still have hope that because they want to have a compromise with the assembly that they can have a same as bill? Do you, do you have hope in, you know, through discussions and conference or whatever that there would be a compromise before the year is out? Not only did Rabbi Posner teach me how oh. to play baseball, he told, taught me Not to predict the future. always have hope. Okay. So yeah. we only have about five minutes left, and I really wanted to ask you about your other role as president of the National Association of Jewish Legislators of New York. And uh, that's a group that uh, is quite large in New York State legislature. Because I believe we have probably more... Jewish legislators than any other state. California may be close. They well, may actually be a little bit ahead but, of us. But not just that, you have two categories of, mem of members for the group. You have Jewish members and associate Jewish members. Right? Well, associate members. Associate yes. members, okay. Yes. So the associate members are non-Jews who have a Jewish footprint in their district. Or they just want to be associated with the uh, National Association. Well. I did an analysis, mm -hmm. and I found out that 96% of the state legislature is either Jewish or has a Jewish footprint. So if you have a meeting <laughs> of the Jewish <laughs> legislators, you will have basically a joint session of the legislature. We probably <laughs> would. And you're going to have 4% we... upset because they don't have anyone in there. You know, last month we had uh, a public meeting uh, with uh, Amir Sagi. Yes. Uh, the deputy general counsel of uh, the Israeli consulate. And even though it was, we were in the middle of budget time, and I'm sure we were in any number of crises, mm -hmm. uh, that was very, very well attended. And uh, that's one of the things that we tried to do. What was the major issue, trade with Israel, or? It was an uh, update. The, the major issue was, and uh, because this was right at about the time of the election, it was just after the election, uh, the issue was the political landscape Mm -hmm. of Israel and the, um, and, and the landscape in Israel in terms of um, how, how it's going to manage to get along with, uh, if it can, with its, uh, with its Arab neighbors of the and Persian neighbors. Of the, hundred, of the uh, <laughs> 150 members of the, of the state assembly, 27, uh, six Republicans and 21 Democrats have no Jewish footprint in their district. When you say no Jewish footprint, no Mark, I'm not sure there's I know no what you mean. There's no synagogue, there's no JCC, there's no Jewish organization, there's just, I mean, they might have a couple of Jews that go travel to another synagogue in another district. So these, but these, these, are, no, these are folks who are probably from some of the more remote parts of no, New York State. No, they're from people, and there are three, uh, one Republican senator and two Democrat senators that have no Jewish footprint. This is like a statistical analysis yeah. of the game well, of baseball. I, I Are you going to tell me if they're uh, they're, they're right-handed or left-handed? I will tell you <laughs> that there you are tell me how often they daven in Brooklyn. <laughs> in uh, well, Kimberly Jean Pierre from Long Island, she's has no Jewish footprint that I could find. But she's from her. Suffolk County, so there's JCCs that are are near but her. What and I'm saying synagogues. is, that, but she also represents New Montefiore Cemetery. And well, we got a lot of dead Jews. So she's, so <laughs> now, if we were in Chicago, <laughs> if we were still in Chicago, my friend well, Rabbi, those would be, that would Chicago, still be right. the voting public. That's right. And then, like Phil Ramos from Suffolk, has no Jewish footprint. But you should hear him speak Yiddish. I know. Well, I doubt it. <laughs> so they make some have Jews over and there. Then, <laughs> but you know, Vivian Cook, Jeff Aubrey from Queens, he's got no, you know, he represents the Mets and City Field, but he's got no. But Jeff has synagogues within a mile or two of his district. He's got synagogues in, in Forest Hills and on Queens Boulevard. Right, but so, not in his district. But I, I see the distinction okay. that you're drawing, Okay. but I think it's well, you important gotta... for us to, to realize or to acknowledge that New York State is, is very culturally Jewish, but, and even right. Jeff's district, which I know very well, while it may not have a synagogue or right. a JCC, has Jews living in it. That's right, who go to another dist assembly district to take advantage of the Jewish uh, Precisely. Culture. Okay, but you have to set the parameters somehow in some way. 
I guess so. Okay, so that's, you I had to do it's something. It's definitional. Figure this if out. there's one Jew living there, <laughs> it's, it's a, a Jewish, Jewish district. district. And it's yeah, not. So. I, and that's I, why I'm saying. My family yeah. moved around a lot, so I, I lived I in places it. where there were no Jews. Felix Ortiz, in, who represents like, uh, you know, an, a very Hispanic area in Brooklyn, has no, you know. What about Luis Sepulveda? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, he's got nothing. He's, I, I haven't found anyone. All right, because his grandmother was Jewish. Well, that could be. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not, but he's Some not. Jew over here, doesn't mother's, mother's <laughs> But he's baby. not. And, uh, you know, Latrice Walker, Maritza Davila, Annette Robinson, Nick Perry in Brooklyn, even though he has parts of Canarsie, it's not the parts that are. I get it. Okay. I so get it. And people, what do we do but, with that? But, but we have to get more Jews to move into but, their yeah. districts. But, very, but it's very interesting that you mention this because a lot of people would think that it's upstate that is in the more rural areas that don't have the Jewish footprint. But the districts are larger upstate. Yes, so they you are. have more of an opportunity to find at least one synagogue in those assembly districts or one There uh, is no Jewish such thing as one synagogue. Well, I, Every yeah. little town <laughs> has two. Well, you know that. We don't go to, I understand. <laughs> so, you know, you would but but you know, you, there are fewer upstate that don't have a Jewish footprint than in New York City area. Oh, and no, I and I'm here to happy to give you, you know this. Know what I say about this? Yeah. Um, Toda Rabah for okay. telling me. Okay, and I wanted to let you know also that you know you see the uh, all these heritage days. Yes. Uh, but we don't have a Jewish heritage day to celebrate our culture, and with all these legislators and with all this culture in New York State, why don't we? Well, we had Yom Yerushalayim several years ago. But we do celebrate we do celebrate holidays, uh, and we celebrate holidays in the assembly. But, but I'm talking if you're about talking Noel about of the legislature, where you you know they have uh, the Turkish Day, Taiwan Day, Canada Day. I mean, they have all all these other. We, heritage we just days. had Amir Sagi in the well. We do this every year. Oh, and by the way, while you're on that subject, and this is a good segue, on May 5th at one o'clock in the Empire State Convention Center is going to be a very interesting uh, ceremony involving the president of Albania, and it's going to com commemorate uh, the Albanian uh, heroic effort in saving Jewish lives during oh, the Second World War. And that's a that. okay. good thing. Albania is a very, very Mayfield unique time, so country. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's coming at to the, at, the end of, <laughs> at the end of the Second World War, the, Albania had more Jews than it did at the beginning right. of the Second World War. So different. we have a lot of events that that we okay. uh, that that we observe and celebrate okay. uh, that do people. touch on um, on our culture okay. and our heritage. Okay. You know, with that over here, we have to say goodbye. But you know, listen, you say shalom, but shalom means goodbye, but it all means hello. So you'll have to come up again, uh, Chuck. And, and it's so. It's a real pleasure talking to you the, always. The pleasure is mine, Rabbi. Yes, it's great. a joy to be here. Much Thank you, Mark. You. And we're gonna we're gonna root for the Cubs this Oy year. We'll <laughs> throw you out of New York State over Mets. here. And the Mets as well. All right. <laughs> Thank you.